We started using laser in the practice, low-level laser in the practice, um, just about six years ago. Um, my first experience had been actually a personal one. Um, I was having an issue with arthritis in my hands that had limited uh, my surgery schedule. Uh, after years of doing surgery for several hours during the day, I was finding it very difficult because of as a result of some stiffness and things like um, that. When I found that use of the NSAIDs um, were not really acceptable, um, not only did they not really help enough, um, but I also did have some um, gastrointestinal problems, not unusual with them. Uh, I had a client who came in who I hadn't seen in a while and happened to mention to me that he had gotten trained in low-level laser therapy. Uh, he suggested I come in. I figured I had nothing to lose and found that a laser for my arthritis condition was very effective to a point that within a matter of um, maybe a couple of weeks and five or six treatments, I was back to normal surgery schedule. Uh, when I realized that this could be something invaluable in our practice, um, and that now is going back about seven and a half years ago, I felt it was uh, initially uh, the most logical thing to do would be to look into a company whose equipment had been used on me uh, with, a, with a great degree of success. Um, I looked at Thor Laser as well as some others, and I found that Thor uh, was the only company that was really much, much more involved in the science and the research with regards to low-level laser therapy at the time. Um, it didn't take very long before um, James Carroll, who's the CEO of the company, um, was in touch with me and frequently um, sending me papers. Um, so I found that Thor was really very much cutting edge as far as uh, what they knew about laser and were very aware of what was going on on an international scale and continue to be um, the company that probably is most involved with a, a lot of the very, very current um, randomly controlled studies and research. The, the, the list of conditions expands on a daily basis. Initially, as I think that most of us are familiar with who are familiar with laser, I realize that uh, osteoarthritis is probably the number one use, or at least traditionally became the number one use. Um, at this point in time, it certainly remains a large part of the practice, is treatment of osteoarthritis. Um, but has expanded into so many other areas that it's even hard to remember them all. Um, certainly we're using it quite a bit um, for um, non-healing wounds, um, you know, when we see them. We're using laser both um, pre-surgically uh, for a lot of orthopedic conditions as well as post-surgically. Uh, conditions such as, such as anterior cruciate ligament uh, repairs, uh, luxating patella repairs, um, fracture repairs. Um, rather than just using a post-surgically, we find that if we use it pre-surgically uh, as well as post-surgically, um, that the response of the patient seems to be um, very, very quick as far as, um, as, as weight-bearing. Um, in addition to uh, pre- and post-surgical as well as arthritis and other orthopedic conditions, uh, as I already alluded to, some wounds that um, are slow to heal we have used it on. I've used it on a series of corneal ulcers, particularly ulcers of an indolent uh, or a rodent ulcer type. Um, we have found that it, um, that it speeds healing with that as well. Um, we have dabbled a bit in using it in some cats with chronic renal disease. Not enough at this point in time for, really, for me really to comment um, how I feel about it, um, but it is another usage um, that we've, we've extended to as well. Uh, acute otitis and chronic otitis, uh, we have found it's very effective um, for that as well as, as a result of decrease, as, as, a, um, as an additive to decreasing the inflammation, making the pet much more comfortable. Um, soft tissue trauma, acute soft tissue trauma, um, when there isn't actually a fracture, uh, we find that it will go a long way to re relieving uh, the relief and discomfort from um, the pets. And we've also used it for um, what's commonly referred to, of course, in human medicine as TBI or traumatic brain injury. Um, kittens that have perhaps, gotten, perhaps have, have um, uh, received trauma, um, dogs that have been hit by cars, cats that have been hit by cars. When there's head injury and head trauma, uh, we've used it for that as well, um, along the lines with some of the research that has been done at this point in time uh, in human medicine, actually some of it um, right here in, in Boston at Mass General. Uh, I think initially, um, as all of us were, I was a bit skeptical, even though I had been a successful laser patient, um, wasn't necessarily thinking it was the, the next greatest thing to come along. Um, since that time, however, uh, I've been absolutely 
uh, mesmerized by the number of conditions that we've used it on and, and the efficacy. Um, I've, I've gotten to a point where, and I discussed this with, um, with the other doctors here not long ago, that if we see a patient that we have felt was a good laser candidate for whatever the condition was, uh, be it osteoarthritis, uh, be it uh, degenerative disc disease, which is a usage that uh, I almost forgot to mention, that's, that's a huge usage for it, or back issues and degenerative disc disease as well as spondylosis. But if we've gotten a patient to three or four treatments and we're not seeing any response or the client doesn't think they've witnessed any change, we really go back and take a second look at two things. Um, first of all, we'll take a look and, and verify that our, our protocol is the appropriate protocol. But even more importantly, if we haven't seen some sort of improvement by about the third or fourth treatment, we really start to question our diagnosis and look further to see if there's something we have missed. Um, so as far as efficacy is concerned, when I asked the other veterinarian here who's um, younger than I am, which means he might have been a little bit more resistant at first having um, finished his training more recent, we're seeing considerably greater than 90% in conditions when we expect it to work. And what I mean by that, um, some of these really out there conditions that one might try it on, like degenerative myelopathy, uh, when we have no expectation, can't really count those into the mix. But as the typical things, uh, as I mentioned previously, at 90% or greater efficacy. I think it, with the efficacy that we're seeing, with 90 to 95%, I, I, would, I would have to believe the answer to that question is no. And, and in reality, probably given most of our protocols, 80% of what we do is not even with the class 3 laser, which of course is what Thor is. Probably 80% of the treatments that, um, the treatments that we actually apply um, are done with uh, a high energy or high power, I should say, LED device. Um, there seems to be a misconception that only class 4 laser will work. The class 4 laser has um, greater power, better penetration. A reality is that much of the research right now and several of the randomly controlled studies are not even being done with laser, they're being done with LED. Uh, in, a, um, in an experiment that was recently completed, actually they did show penetration of LED to a depth of about 3 centimeters, um, which uh, previous to that was felt to be only possible um, with class 3 and class 4 lasers. Um, so I think that the the argument of a class 3 versus a class 4 laser um, has been greatly overblown to a point that if someone asked me, um, if they said to me, okay, we, you have um, two laser probes or three laser probes, we're only going to let you have one to uh, achieve your treatments, which one would you choose? I would give up the laser probe in a moment compared to um, the broad base or the broad usage that we do have of the LED. So I think in regards to the class four, class three, um, I really think it's a non-argument. I think that there has been information that's been put out um, that was not necessarily grounded on hard research. Um, I think as we go forward, we're gonna see more and more and more studies um, done with lower level and not even using, um, not even using the L not even using uh, laser probes whatsoever. LED has got a far far safer margin for error. It is impossible to burn anything with laser. It's even impossible to cause any retinal damage with an LL LED. Um, so I think as far as the the class three or class four argument, as far as I'm concerned, it's um, it's just fodder for uh, um, for the marketing people. That's a tough one to answer. Um, I would say that um, the amount that we use the unit um, outweighs any other piece of electronic equipment we have in the practice. Um, on any given day, it's, we're going to use the laser a minimum of probably five to, to seven times, and that's a minimum. Uh, our practice is not a huge practice. It's not a small practice. Uh, we're a three-person practice here. Um, to give you an idea that there are some days when we have used the laser as many as 13 or 14 different patients um, depending upon uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, one thing it has uh, impacted significantly um, is our use of NSAIDs. I had the hospital administrator take a look at our NSAID use um, over the, I guess, nearly six years we've been using laser now. Um, back in 2007 the, or 2006, the last year we did not use laser at all, 
Um, NSAIDs accounted for about 0.71% of our gross income. Um, now, those NSAIDs included um, Deramax, probably Rimadil at the time, Medicam. Um, for 2012, which we just finished, um, uh, NSAIDs accounted for, I think it was 0.3 or 0.31 percent of our gross income. On the other hand, laser, and I'm referring to just the laser treatments, this has nothing to do with some of the preliminary um, work or the follow-up, such as um, radiology, such as serum testing for tick-borne diseases that oftentimes will accompany the use of laser. Um, uh, laser accounts for 4 percent of what our, our, our gross income was for the past year. So while NSAIDs have gone down to less than half, um, lasers become in effect a new profit center that didn't even exist in 2006 and now accounts for a huge, huge percentage um, of our income. I think the other thing that should be brought up as well, it also makes the client a much more um, participatory, participatory piece of promoting the health for their pet. Um, we have our expectations when we um, think that we're going to see benefit of the laser treatments, but we're constantly involving the client um, as far as if they think treatments are frequent enough. Uh, after we have a pet on maintenance regimen, if it is something that does require maintenance, rather than us saying you've got to come in every two weeks or every three weeks or every four weeks, we'll let the client evaluate how often um, we'll continually try to stretch it out to them to a point we may say, um, well, we're going to, do you want to try six weeks? And sometimes clients will say, I'd like to do that. Other times clients will say, you know, I'm really happy with the four weeks. Um, he or she is doing so well. Uh, I don't want to take the chance. So uh, there have been so many ways it's changed the practice, not only just in how we handle certain conditions, um, but also I think how we now involve the client uh, with treating these medical conditions. And of course, in this day and age, when so many veterinarians are complaining about um, about how uh, pharmaceutical sales have, have gone the internet route, here we have a technology, not only is it safe, not only is it extremely efficacious, but it requires the client to come in. And certainly that has value from a standpoint of client flow, income, finding other services that the client may ask about, but even more so, it means we're not just sending these clients out for six or eight or nine months at a time with a bottle of medication or a prescription um, in the hopes that all is well, but rather every month, every five weeks, every six weeks, uh, we can again do an evaluation based on what they tell us. I think that laser therapy has been one of the two most important changes while I've been in practice. I've been a practitioner of longer than 30 years. Uh, when I entered practice, there was no diagnostic ultrasound. Diagnostic ultrasound. Um, certainly, there was no digital radiology. I think probably the two most um, dramatic changes that I, that I have seen in practice has, in fact, been um, diagnostic ultrasound and laser therapy. Um, I think I could no longer practice without it. I think it has so changed our outlook on treatment of disease and management of several conditions. And I think our clients would be very, very disappointed if I walked in here tomorrow and say, okay, game's over, no longer using laser.